welcome to the 40th episode of the Flying Cat Marketing interview series. And today I have uh, the lovely John Thor with us, who is content marketing lead at Scribe. Scribe is an electronic signature platform um, and also the co-founder of Syzygy, a user data platform and uh, an artist, content marketing uh, expert, <laughs> LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Um, Guy, you know, I'm just really happy to have you on here. Well, so happy to be on here. Always fun. And um, from our previous conversations, I know we'll have a lot to talk about. So um, I think the biggest challenge will be to squeeze it all into one episode. Yes. Um, and worst case scenario, we can record another episode. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds like a good plan B to have in the in the back pocket. Yeah, so we were having a, a conversation, just chatting a little bit before I started hitting record, and you were telling me about joining Scribe in September um, and moving to Stockholm for that. So how are things going in your position now as content marketing lead? Really good. I'm, I'm really enjoying like um, being a part of a bigger team. You know, um, when I was freelancing and as part of Syzygy, um, I was working mostly either on my own um, for a client or with very small teams, you know, even partnering up with some entrepreneurs, it would only be two or three of us. And, um, and Syzygy was four of us that just started with um, an idea that was crazy enough for us to sit down and go, is this possible? Yeah, it's possible. Let's do it. Um, and it's, it's a fun change of pace to suddenly have um, a growing company which you know it's a startup starting in Stockholm but now spreading across more European countries and getting to be a part of something that was already established from a technical point of view but really needed a bit of a push to make the brand recognizable exciting and something that people would see and go I know exactly what that's about um, was a really interesting next step for me after having um, sort of had my finger in a lot of different pies um, throughout the past few years. Yeah, you had mentioned that before you actually started working full time for Scribe, you did some freelancing work for them. Um, so what's the, the difference? How's that transition going? So that transition was actually really smooth because um, a... A big reason for, I guess, that transitionary period was um, originally I was going to join them full time. And um, I'd been speaking with um, George, our head of enterprise, for you know a couple of years on LinkedIn. He'd been following my content. And then one day he just kind of reaches out and says, hey, if, if you ever want to move to Sweden, let me know. Let's let's work together. And um, George didn't know this at the time, but I'd been thinking about Sweden as sort of my next international move for probably about a year, year and a half at that point. And so we start talking. I had way too many projects on, including Syzygy at the time. And I said, look, let's pick this up in six months. Six months pass. We pick up the conversation again. And once we sort of determine a date for when we should fully kick this off and I'm ready to start booking flights, start looking at apartments. And um, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but there's a bit of a global pandemic going on. Um, yeah, apparently, you know, it's, um, it's being talked about in some news, um, news mediums. I don't know. Uh, no, but seriously, um, Corona hit at just like the point when we're about to start planning everything. And rather than just let the momentum die, the sort of, um, workaholic entrepreneur at my heart goes, how do we make this work? How do we make this work when we're in separate countries? We don't have the opportunity for me to, you know, get a Scribe laptop or get set up in any of the systems because obviously working with a lot of, like you said, electronic signature, electronic identification, it's a lot of legal tech um, and not being able to get fully set up as someone from a distance. How do we work together? So really part of that work was just getting to know where has the brand been so far? Where did it come from? What was the initial idea? What do people know them for? And where, where's the brand going? And how can I help shape that? So some of the stuff I worked with as a freelancer really laid the foundation for me to figure out where were some of the gaps that when I would join full time, I would focus a lot of my time and energy on. So what did you find how has uh, your position as content lead, how has that been able to shape the, the brand? So 
first of all, I'd say the the gaps I found were were not really in the shape of you know um, things that have been done wrong, but more as as probably anyone listening who's had a startup before will know when you're working with a small team, like you do the best with what you've got. And sometimes you don't even realize what you haven't like put the work into. And what Scribe had was like a brilliant solution. They had absolute um, love from the market in Sweden. But then when it came to sort of talking about it outside of Sweden, there was a certain, I guess, I'm just going to be kind of um, blunt and say there was a certain sexiness missing from the brand in terms of like, if if someone says, well, why should I care? Why should I choose this over something else? Um, there were a lot of like logical reasons. There was a lot of features and benefits and everything, but that's not really where you want to win. Because if you go in a race of features, anyone's going to catch up with you and just try to undercut you on price. It's the same. It's the same battle, really. Um, so it was about, you know, how do we differentiate? Uh, one of my favorite quotes about um, branding or building businesses comes from the ex-CEO of Cisco who said, um, being different is better than being better. Okay. Um, and the reason why I love it is because being better is subjective, but being different is just something you are. And it's something that I've based a lot of my work on both as, um, as a you know, consultant and as a musician. Um, and I try to keep this in mind because if you're always thinking of how do I become better, you're, you're trying to compete in a competition that in most cases exists in your head alone. Like you're going, I want to be better than that person, but they might not even know they're competing. And you need to start thinking, how, how do I want to be perceived and how do I become the best version of that? And as an example, like, um, I think this is one of the things that I really enjoyed about joining a growing company is that we've got a team of people who all have deep expertise in something, but not everything. And I've, I became so used to needing to be a bit of a generalist as an entrepreneur, where if someone asked, oh, I need this, that, that I might be really strong in, but I also need a bit of this. There's this tendency to go, yeah. Yeah, I, I can do that. I'll, I'll make it work. And you just, you jump at the opportunity. So I learned a lot, but I also learned where I want to focus. So we've got great people on the team that are experts in user experience, in paid marketing, in SEM and SEO. And to be honest, like, and again, to be pretty blunt, I just don't really care for that part of it. Like I get how important it is but it's just not my jam. I, I don't really enjoy the hunt for keywords and all that, but I love the creation of content. And I think the danger of doing that in a silo and again, trying to be better is that I think we sometimes start to then underestimate the value that we bring with those specific talents. Like for me, I've, I've been writing and creating stories my whole life. So it's really easy for me to forget that, um, that not everyone does that. And like meeting people that say, oh, I just don't know what to write about on LinkedIn, or I just don't know. And I, I'm kind of like, wow. But you just do like this, this, and this. And I, I say something that's like super obvious to me. People go, wow, <laughs> ne never, never thought of that. And I think getting to experience that from both sides with a team that's so knowledgeable, each in their separate corners, um, has really helped me, I think, um, figure out my own niche even more and has allowed me to sort of let go of um, some of the aspects of, of work that I wouldn't necessarily want to focus on anyway, but I would have to if I didn't have such a great mm -hmm. team around me. Yeah, it's interesting that you point out the SEO PPC thing and um, Everything that you were just saying just makes me think about how there's so many B2B marketers out there. Not, I wouldn't say B2B marketers. I would say the people who are hiring B2B marketers mm. <laughs> who are saying, uh, you know, we just need to get revenue. Like, where are my ads? Demand generation. And there's a lot less focus on brand for some reason, as if that's supposed to only be the remit of B2C. Forgetting the fact that brand is everything in B2B because there are so many decision makers. And at the end, like you said, 
you're selling, so I don't mean to put Scribe down, but you're selling electronic signatures platform. There's a bunch of other electronic signature platforms. Um, and then there's a lot of decision makers as well who are deciding which one are we gonna use and why. So at the end of the day, it is a lot to do with the brand and the sexiness that you're mentioning because you're saying, oh, I wanna use Scribe. Oh yeah, I know that. Oh yeah, okay, the CEO knows it. Oh, okay, operations manager also knows it. Okay, COO also knows it. Sounds like it's, it's pretty legit, right? And the only way to get everybody to recognize those, it's not through PPC, it's not through SEM, it's through building a brand and telling that story. Absolutely. And I, I see very much the PPC and the SEO and everything as a great delivery mechanism for what your brand already is. So if you build like for us, a big focus is on like customer centricity. And I know that's like the most cliche thing I could say right now. Like there's not a business out there that's like, we don't give a shit about our customers. We're employee centric. Like I, I realize that, but but if you can highlight that in, in an interesting way that again, differentiates you and then push that through SEO, PPC, all that good stuff, you're able to, as you said, get people to recognize, ah, that's Scribe. If we yeah. become a customer of theirs, they'll really care. They'll really do their best. Like yeah. if, like you said, you've got these different stakeholders that know that, that's where you win. Yeah. So I'm going to, so I, I'm an SEO, uh, an SEO, I guess, SEO optimizer. Con but I would say more on the more content focused delivered by SEO. Um, so I'm not going to bag on SEO because I do think that it's an amazing way to actually oh. build brand. Um, especially for not well for even non non branded and branded keywords, both of them are building brand delivering this story. And yeah, it's about the it, it's tricky to find this balance between I need to deliver on the search intent. Um, and then also, but I need to tell my angle, I need to tell my story and I need to get my narrative into this content without messing up the search intent. Um, so you you guys have a pretty big marketing team then. So Technically, not really. So we're what, 13 people, but we've just we've like doubled in the last six months. Okay. So it's really fast moving. Um, we got some new investors on board shortly before I joined, actually, um, which is allowing us to grow that way and really look into the future in, the, in, um, in a different way. And I think um, just to as well reiterate or um, explain as well, like, if there are some SEO masters out there that got really offended by what I said, <laughs> what I meant was not at all that SEO isn't important. Like I totally get, for me, it's kind of like um, if I use a music analogy, because I, I quite like doing that. It's kind of like you can be really into writing music and not at all want to record or mix or master it. It doesn't mean it's not important. It's just not what you want to do. Yeah. And that's very much how I see this, um, even though that analogy from a music perspective doesn't really appeal to me because I love the whole process. But from a marketing perspective, um, there's like there's a niche where I know that I want to be there. And that's why I'm really grateful to have people that are like just as passionate about what they do. And I'm like, I don't I don't like this, but man, knock yourself out. Definitely do your best there. So how do you find how have you managed to find this kind of sexiness? Um, for a product like Scribe? So for me, it's uh, it's not that different from any other type of technology because um, I, I actually, funnily enough, found a lot of my success as a freelancer helping companies with products that typically wouldn't be considered very sexy and finding ways to get people to care. And the the single most important thing I say to all of them is it's never about what your technology does. It's about what it enables people to do. And that's where I see storytelling as being just the number one thing. Like if, if I just came up to someone and said, hey, I can write copy for your website. Like, cool. Anyone with Microsoft Word or WordPress or Google Docs could do that. And if I go, I could write really good copy for your website. Still, no one cares. I could write copy that converts. Everyone's going to say that. But if I can tell a story of a client who was like, I'll, I'll take an actual example. I had this content or no, I'm this branding um, agency out in Portland in the US um, who saw some of my content, reached out and we started talking and they said, 
we help people with their brand all day long. But when we look at our own brand, we feel like we're surgeons trying to operate on ourselves. And they just really struggle to nail down why it is that people want to work with them. And I remember sitting down with our board, we mapped out what made them special, helped them really clarify their messaging. And I got a text message from one of the owners of the business less than 24 hours later going, hey, I tried some of the stuff you told me on in a meeting and the client literally closed this notebook and went, we're going to work together. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat there and like, this is, this is the story I'm going to tell every time because um, not because it's my only story, which I know might sound like that from there, but, um, but because it's one of the best examples for me where these guys knew branding, but they had, they had trouble stepping outside of themselves for long enough to look at what do others see? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's one of the most important things you get from bringing someone external in. It's just getting someone to be the devil's advocate to go, well, why do people like you? Well, let me talk to some of your customers. Let me review some of the stuff you've done for others. And then sort of nailing that down into some sort of storytelling, some sort of narrative, some tone of voice that really, that really speaks to the people you're trying to speak to. So tone of voice I get, narrative I get. I still have trouble sometimes wrapping my brain around the term storytelling. Um, yep. It's a buzzword. A lot of people use it. The way that I understand it, I completely agree that it's really important. Um, but it sometimes sounds to me, well, storytelling, like the story that you just told, it's a case study. Um, so how do you get a story of like, I helped this customer achieve this goal or remove this pain or whatever? Um, sorry, let me rephrase the question. How do you define storytelling and how is it used in, in marketing um, in, in the way that you understand it? Because I just feel like it's, it's a word that's thrown around a lot. It's, it's definitely a buzzword. And I think it's, um, it's kind of the same as with, with branding. You know, people say they're working on personal branding because they post every day on LinkedIn, but you could post every day on LinkedIn for 10 years and still not have a brand. Um, and I feel like both of them are buzzwords because they are poorly defined or difficult to define. But um, for me, one of the key aspects of that storytelling is that it takes you on some kind of journey. That at the start of what you're reading at the end of it, you have not only gone from one place to another, but for lack of a better way of putting it, there's a middle bit that that is some sort of transitionary period. And you mentioned case study. So as an example of it, I could make a case study that has no story where I just yeah, put some statistics it, right? out. Yeah. Where, yeah. yeah. Where I would just say, yeah, Scribe helped this company, you know, reduce their administration time by 50%. There's not really a story there. There's a fact. Yeah. But the, the story for me comes from, um, I almost see it like investigative journalism where it's like, but, but why did they need to do that? Where were they before? What was the problem that was so severe that they thought we really need someone to come in and put some technology in this? Um, and I feel like, you know, you can have good storytelling and bad storytelling. Like you could, you could add a little bit of story around it and it still wouldn't be good. But I feel like there are a few different aspects where you really need to think about um, not just what you think is really cool, but what will your customers or your prospective customers think is really cool? What will they care about? And how can you put that into terms that really bring out the emotional factor of it? Not just saying, you know, they had stacks of paperwork on their desks. They didn't want stacks of paperwork on their desk. <laughs> now they're digital. They solved. <laughs> like you, you want something where you showcase where it is. And Again, if I take a real life example, we recently published a case study with Volkswagen Financial Services um, and the Volkswagen Group um, as a whole, where they were really struggling with things like errors in paperwork. And it's literally down to the fact that like, when you fill in a paper contract, the contract does not let you know if you've done something incorrectly. So they'd get a customer to sign it, they'd sign it themselves, they'd scan it in and they'd send it to the headquarters. Then like two days later, someone reads through it and goes, crap, this is wrong, sends it back. 
they have to call the customer back in the customer has to do it all over again and just hope and pray to whatever day do you believe in that this time it went fine um and like that story if told correctly you go wow this is not what i want to put my customers through this is not what i want to create for my employees and even though there's just a few facts there just adding a little bit of color maybe some quotes from people within the business um more examples you get a story and i i actually think storytelling is despite being a massive buzzword now i still think it's under underrated as as an ability for so many different people whether it's marketing sales um because again this is one of the things that i always underestimate in myself when un, until i meet someone who's really really bad at storytelling because right. because right. <laughs> i think um probably the single thing that separates like bad and okay storytellers from good and great storytellers is knowing what to edit yeah um and the example i love taking is like um i had a friend who went traveling and then we went to meet up and they'd show me this slideshow of photos from traveling they'd stop on a photo and go yeah so this was at this hotel in this country no actually what was the name of the hotel no the hotel was different no this wasn't in that country this was after we and you get this whole thing of them trying to figure out exactly where and when it was only to find out it had no bearing on the rest of the story and this is something that you some people notice it consciously some people don't but if you'd read if we continue with a case study example a case study that has like a loose end a piece of the story that didn't need to be there some people will notice it but the people that won't notice it will still feel it mm -hmm. there's going to be something unresolved there's something that just doesn't fit and i think that's something that's really important when we when we think about storytelling is what needs to be there what makes it better and if it doesn't need to be there and it doesn't make it better just take yeah. it out yeah i think that it, case studies are actually a great example of this um because there are so many out there that are boring not shareable um they they've been created just for a sales guide to say these are numbers that we got or something like that but it yeah. lacks the story um it lacks the so it lacks the story to make it shareable. And it also, a lot of them lack the story for somebody else who's reading it to say, oh, I see myself in that. I wanna keep reading and see how they solve this problem um, and getting them actually to read it like a story rather than I just need to look at numbers or results that, that this person got and, and to actually create it into a, a piece of content. Um, and I love that, but that's, so that's one story of, for example, Volkswagen, what happened with them. Um, that's one specific story, but then you can actually take that and turn it into an overall story that shows up in a lot of different, in a lot of different places. Yeah. How do Absolutely. you define like, what is the story or is that the strategic narrative? Sorry, can you, um, I'm not sure I completely get the question. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm the the story that we're telling on a consistent basis. Is it a bunch of different stories or is there one story that a brand should tell? So I think this is something that I really struggled with. If I then if I sort of take a step back away from Scribe and towards my own personal brand, um, I remember just after I delivered my TED talk, one of the other speakers there that had been doing it for like decades um, comes up to me and just says, um, make sure you define what you want to speak about before someone else does, because people are really quick to label you whether you want to or not. And I've always been really adamant about like not pigeonholing myself. I've always hated when people are like, oh, you're that type, because um, I don't really see myself as a singular type. I've always been interested in a lot of different things. And to begin with, this really bugged me. And I remember sitting there and being like, crap, do I really have to choose one thing to be passionate about, one thing to talk about? And it wasn't until I kind of turned it on its head when I thought it's not about finding one thing. It's about finding what combines all the different things that you care about. Mm -hmm. And 
as an example, if I then take a step again towards Scribe, that was one of the exercises we did really early on after I joined. Um, I sat down with a couple of people from the marketing team and the CEO, and we thought, what is consistently important for this brand? What is it that customers have come to expect? And not necessarily how do we want to be perceived, but how, how are we perceived? And what, what parts of that do we want to highlight? And an early part of that was really just helping guide companies towards better customer experiences. And what we then did, and this is a, an experiment or a um, sort of a thought process that ex I'd really recommend to anyone looking to really find a concrete brand. It's once you find something like that, like write it down and then go through a lot of different examples. Try to find a scenario within your business that it doesn't apply to. If you struggle to find that, you might have found like your mission statement. Because when we started thinking about this in all the different, like you said, all the sort of micro stories, all the different customers, we go, is, this a, is there a story in there where our goal was not to help guide them towards a goal they already had? Was there an area where someone was not trying to provide better customer experience? And no, there, there really wasn't. And we weren't just trying to give people a technology and say, here, this fixes it. We were looking to sit down and understand what's their journey and sort of guide them. And um, an example that I love to take or an analogy is um, Dante's Divine Comedy. You know, Dante is the lead character in the story, but it's Virgil that leads him through hell up to purgatory. And then it's only the, that last bit of the mountain he has to climb on his own now that Virgil has given them the tools to go on. And I very much see a company like Scribe, and I very much saw myself as a freelancer as that Virgil persona in any communication I had with a client where it was not my job to be the star. I get plenty of that when I do public speaking, and I do love that center of attention feeling, but there's a time and a place for it. So I'll happily be Dante in my own life, but when I'm working with a client, I'll step to the side as Virgil. I think that that's such an important aspect of storytelling is making the client the hero of the story because that's the only way if you're if you're telling a specific case study or if you're just having the copy on a landing page making them the hero is what's going to make them be able to say this is something I need this is these people understand me they've been in my shoes and I love that you did that analogy about it. So another question um, is about the content that um, that you're creating, because there's only so much I can imagine that you can write about electronic signatures. So how are you weaving the story of perhaps digital transformation? I guess that's something that you guys are helping companies lead through. What is your plan for, are, are you involving that into your content strategy or how do you balance those out? Absolutely, so I, I very much see like content marketing as a, I guess if you want to call it a four-pronged um, strategy or a four-pronged um, just like idea where, you know, there is the content creation where you create something like, let's say whether it's a white paper or a guide or a blog, then there's a documentation where you're simply documenting what you're doing. So one of the best sources of content is just, what, what are you doing with your clients? What are your salespeople working on? What's the product team working on? Um, then there's the repurposing. No piece of content should only be one piece of content. There's always more to be told. You know, you could take this recording we're doing and you could release a video recording of it in snippets on LinkedIn. You can create, you can unleash it as a whole podcast and then you can create a blog post, like top five points that came out of this episode. And that way you'll reach different audiences. Uh, and the four bit, fourth bit is engaging. And this is where I see, well, I think it's between the repurposing and the engaging where I see most uh, companies actually fall short because you can't just post something on your company's LinkedIn page and then go, right, we'll, we'll leave it there and hopefully someone will find it. You need to engage and you need to get people within your own business engaged in yeah. writing their own content or sharing that content and writing their own thoughts around it, elaborating and really weaving a web of interconnected branding that um, 
you know, I, I always say it's like it's in the employee's voice, but it's the brand that they're showcasing. And I think what um, what a lot of companies struggle with with there is the fact that, you know, they they either think they need to go above and beyond to create something incredibly um, poignant and new and complicated sometimes it's the simple stuff that just knocks it out of the park. Like, um, you know, we talked about Syzygy in the beginning of the interview. The, the thing that got that company the attention that we got and got investors interested and got us the speaking slots and everything was every single day that we were working on it, we were posting updates. Like um, one of my favorite things to do was going up to our CTO without warning him, picking up my phone and going, hey, Ryan, what you're working on? And then I would just film him for like 30 seconds going, uh, I'm, you know, getting the AI to recognize the difference between a film director and a, you know, um, sales director so that people know what kind of CVs they're getting. It's like, cool, good luck, done. And we'd post this and people just loved seeing what was going on. And we, we give updates on things that went well, things that didn't. When we had like a closed beta test, we'd update people on funny things like how when you put my CV in our system in the very beginning before we did um, contextual language analysis in the AI, it picked up as if I'd been like a board member of businesses since I was 17 or 18 um, because I used to work in the theater as a writer and director. And it just picked up director. So it was like, hey, this guy has like 12 years of board experience when I did not. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good way of doing it. I think that um, not that doesn't come as se second nature to everybody. Um, they were lucky to have somebody like you on the team to have that idea. Do you Are you doing similar things with Scribe or do you feel like you have to push that so I'm basically the short answer is I'm going to, um, you know, I, I started in September and really my, my initial thought was I'm going to dive directly into that. But then it was like, okay, let's, let's walk before we run. Um, and at first I wanted to define what we were going to do and how we we're going to do it and really kind of do the important bits so that everyone knows like, this is what we're going to do. This is the grand scheme of things. But I feel like where we are now, it's it's where that sort of thing can start to really get rolling. Because I think what really worked for Syzygy was the fact that that was part of our DNA from day one. Like we have photos and videos from the meeting where we founded the company because I was already like obsessed with documenting everything. Um, but with Scribe, because I was coming in as an outsider in a way, I, I felt like getting that started immediately, I would kind of just be bringing my brand in and yeah. it wouldn't gel as well. So, but I feel like now I've, I've gelled in, in a way where I can sort of start incorporating that. And um, I've got some really fun ideas that are gonna start coming out soon that I think um, will, will not just copy what I've done before, but rather sort of build upon it. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, well, thank you so much, John, for this time, this chat that you spent with me. I found it very enlightening. Where's the best place for people to connect with you if they want to? Uh, for now, definitely LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm on most of the other social platforms as well, but that's where I'm, I'm most active. Okay, cool. I will link to that in the show notes. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for uh, being here today. And thank you everybody who listened to or watched this episode. If you did like it, please share it, like it, um, and feel free to reach out to me or John um, to talk more about this. So thanks. Yeah!